Hi, Pastor Anthony here. At Vintage Faith Church, we stand behind the Bible's claim to be the Word of God, and we believe that the Scriptures contain everything needed for life and godliness. The Scriptures testify to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We pray that this recording stirs your faith towards that end. This is in no way meant to be a substitute for the local church gathering, which we believe is critical to your growth as a Christian and your walk with Christ. We pray that you will find the sermon edifying and challenging. Thank you for listening. Hello and good morning. April may not be a good month for weather around here, but for Christians, April is very cool. I can't help but think of football coaches and those underdog uh, sport movies where they're always like, this is our time. Our time is now. And yes. That's what I think of April. Um, Jesus and Easter and you know Christianity, I've heard it said, it covers a whole lot of stupid. Okay. We are in the New Testament this morning for our scripture reading. I'm reading from the book of Colossians, okay? Colossians chapter 2, 13 to 15. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So as you know, we, we've been in a, kind of a mini-series here on uh, um, the promise, the promise plan of God. And, and you're hearing it week in and week out, you're hearing kind of the unfolding of the promise that was given in Genesis in the garden. We're going to put that up on the screen. Uh, Genesis 3.15, this is after Adam and Eve fell and, and they sinned and they listened to the serpent and God comes onto the scene and he announces some judgments and he says to the, to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And, and, and you, you hear this from me constantly, but the reason that you hear it from me constantly is because this verse is a key verse in understanding the whole Bible. Um, in this verse, you have all the theology of the Bible in, in seed form. In fact, Charles Spurgeon says it like this of Genesis 3.15. He says, There lie within it as an oak lies within an acorn all the great truths which make up the gospel of Christ. So think about this verse, and you may think, yeah, I don't quite see it, Pastor, but that's kind of the point. It's, it's the beginning of a revelation that unfolds all throughout the Bible, but, but Spurgeon says it's like, a, it's like an acorn, and it's going to grow into an oak. And we're going to look at a part of this today, the bruising of the head of the serpent and the bruising of the heel of Christ. And we're going to look at, at the New Testament today. So as the Old Testament ends, you have 39 books in the Old Testament spanning roughly 4,000 years, and there's some agreements and disagreements on how many years, but 39 books spanning 4,000 years. And then the New Testament opens, and you have four books right in a row on one man, on one man, and obviously that's not a coincidence. We've looked at that in the Old Testament, how Genesis kind of moves along over many years, and then all of a sudden it's on Abraham, and it just focuses on Abraham for multiple chapters, and you'll see that in the, in the middle of the Old Testament. It's moving along, and then all of a sudden David comes on the scene, and you're just hearing about David, chapter after chapter, book after book. But when you get to the New Testament, it's all about Jesus, because the whole Bible is about and pointing to Christ. Matthew 1.1 1, 1 opens as such. Matthew comes out, guns blazing. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, 
the son of Abraham. So Matthew immediately is saying, hey, I'm going to write a book here about the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Oh yeah, he is the son of David that, that the Bible has been talking about. He's the son of Abraham. He is the promised child. He is the seed of the woman, the seed of Eve, the offspring of Eve. In fact, if, if you look in these four accounts of the life of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 33% of those books focus on one week of Jesus' life. And that's the week that we're in right now. It's called, in High Church, Holy Week. Um, You have from the triumphal entry to Good Friday to the resurrection. 33% of the Gospels focus on this Week. This is a very important week in the life of Christ. So we're going we're gonna to look at the cross today, but before we look at the cross, we're going to do a little bit of the traditional triumphal entry. Um, so imagine this scene. Uh, Jesus is riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. People are going nuts. They're going crazy. They're shouting, um, this is the son of David. Messianic fervor is at the height of the height. The the Jewish people are hearing, hey, our Messiah might be here. We're we're hearing this this man, Jesus, he's raising people from the dead. He's healing people. He's giving sight to the blind. This may be our deliverer. And as you can imagine, a people who've been oppressed and under the thumb of another power, they're probably getting a little bolder. As a child may get bolder as his parents come when he's been maybe over someone else's house and he knows mom and dad are coming and, oh, I can, I can, I'm okay. And the, the people are, they're probably getting bolder and Rome is getting a little freaked out. The city is in an uproar. In Matthew 21, 9 to 10, we, we have it said like this, as Jesus is coming into the, to Jerusalem. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred saying, Who is this? So, so this is it. They're saying this is the son of David. We, we did that if you were here last week. If you missed us last week, it, it's recorded. It's, it's on iTunes. But we talked about how Jesus is the son of David. He is the son of David, the true son of David. And the people knew it. They knew it. They were shouting, Hosanna to, to the son of David. He's here. The Messiah is here. The offspring of the woman is finally here. And he's riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, which is something that a king would do. And it meant, I come in peace. I come in peace. As he makes his way into the city, Luke records this. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. So think about this for a moment. You have the king of the universe, the Lord of all creation. He's coming into the temple where where he was worshipped, where God's people worshipped. He's entering the city of David where God's people were. And he weeps. He weeps. Actually, there's a few words in Greek for weep. that The word here is to wail. It's got an emphasis upon noise. This isn't him shedding a tear. This is Jesus weeping. 
weeping. Over the city, over his people. So John records this as that week continues. John says this. This is Jesus' words. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. So set the scene for you. He's come in to Jerusalem. He's wept for the city. He's about to go to the cross. And what does he say? Now, the ruler of this world, he's talking about Satan, will be cast out. This is what's happening on the cross. We're going to look at the the cross today is, is triumph. It's the triumph of Christ. But Jesus is just head, like just staring at that cross. He comes in, he knows that's where he's going. That's why he came into this world and he is going after the enemy. He is going after the enemy. So as the narrative of Holy Week continues, we have Passover and they're eating and they're having Passover together. And they finish Passover and uh, Spurgeon has a quote here. He says, from the table of communion... The Redeemer arose at midnight and marched forth to the battle. He marched forth to the battle after Passover, after the meal. I want to to, to kind of uh, give you maybe a new way of, of viewing uh, the cross. Maybe maybe it's not new, but it, but the Garden in the cross, Gethsemane in the cross. That this was Jesus. This was his hour. This was his hour to cast out the enemy, and he was going into battle. He was going into battle. The Son of God was going into battle, a battle unlike any of us have ever seen or known. Mark records the garden like this. So again, they had finished Passover, they had eaten a meal together, and they get up, and now they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. So again, think, think about the scene. You're... Your Savior, my Savior, our Savior is in battle at this point. He is in battle with the forces of darkness like we've never known. And it's so hard that he's asking his Father, take this, please, take this from me. Is there another way? Is there another way? This is the humanity of Christ. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but if you don't have a category for the humanity of Christ, you don't have the, the right Christ. Christ, fully God, fully human. And in his humanity, he's asking the Father, I, 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 he's, he's saying, I don't want to do this. Is there another way? This is, this is the, what's before him is horrific. The judgment of God is going to fall on the Son of God. The judgment of God, the wrath of God. 
the sin of all of us, all of the Christians that of, of forever has fallen on to Christ. And he is battling. He is in battle. Charles Spurgeon quotes of, of this scene in Gethsemane. He says this. At this point, the pit is emptying out its legions. Terrible as lions, hungry as wolves, and black as night. The demons rush on in myriads, innumerable offspring. Spitting forth the venom of asps and infixing their poison fangs in the Savior's flesh. One man, one God stands in battle array against ten thousands of principalities and powers. So the idea here is that even before Christ gets to the cross, he goes into that garden and he is battling the enemy for you, for me. He's battling. He's battling. And he falls to the ground and says, remove the cup. And, And again, I would ask you, do you, do you have a category for, for Jesus, a, a human category? This is something the church has, has fought over for, for 1,000, 2,000 years. Like, he, he's not just God. He's not just man. He is fully God and fully human. And this is the beauty and the mystery of Jesus. But if you don't have a human Jesus that you can relate to, that when he is tempted in this way, asking the Father, Please remove it, please remove it, but yet not my will, but your will. He was tempted, but he never sinned. We're tempted in these situations, and we give in. But he was tempted, and he didn't sin. Is your Christ human? Is your Christ God? Maybe you, you relate more to Jesus on a human level, and you need to remember this. He is the Son of God. The offspring of the woman is the Son of God. The Messiah is God in the flesh. If your Christ is not human, you're going to struggle with intimacy. If your Christ is not God, you're going to struggle with his power. He's both, and you need to hold those together. And that's a doctrine that Christianity fights for. In fact, many of the cults get this wrong, and that's why we reject Mormonism and Jehovah Witness. They're using the Bible, but they've got a a different Christ, a Christ that's not fully God and fully human. But I would also submit to you today that if you decide to follow the Lord, that you too will face an unseen battle. It won't be like Christ in the garden, but... The forces of darkness will come against you as well. I'm con- more convinced than ever as uh, I, I do ministry that when a man or a woman decides to um, use their gifts and, and put, take step forwards, take a step forward for Christ, that, that a battle ensues. A battle ensues. And, and we're going to talk a, a bit at the end of what that battle looks like because it's not a physical battle. Um, We're talking principalities, we're talking darkness, lies, battle in the head. Um, I I just heard of, in the last couple weeks, I heard of this concept of anti-fragile. Has anyone heard or read anything about that? Okay, so here's the idea. Fragile, we all know what fragile means. Right? Don't shake it. This thing can break. Uh, be very careful with it. Um, what would you, we naturally think the opposite is durable, but, but durable isn't really uh, the opposite. Fragile, it can break. Durable just means it will break uh, at some point. It's just going to take a lot longer. Uh, the term anti-fragile means the more something gets opposed, the stronger it gets. The more something is opposed, the stronger it gets. And brothers and sisters, this is Christianity. The more trials you're exposed to, the more the enemy comes at you, you get stronger. You're not just durable, you're anti-fragile. This is how the, the Christian faith is, is, is made when you read um, 
the, the scriptures. We, we only get stronger through trials. We only get stronger when people come against us. So I would just you know, say if, if you're in that, and, and many of you I know are in a season like that, God is just he's strengthening you. He, he's strengthening you. You will come out of that um, stronger. All right, so let, let's keep going. The, the narrative continues. Christ in the garden, fighting the principalities of darkness in the garden. And now we have Mark 15. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace. That is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed them in a purple cloak, twisting and twisting together a crown of thorns. They put it on him. And they began to salute him. Hail, king of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. So Jesus is fighting the principalities and the, 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 the dark forces on scene, and, and now he's arrested and he comes in um, and he's being mocked and spit on and scourged and beaten. And they lead him out to crucify him. And this should, we're not going to read it today, but Jesus carries his own cross. If you can remember a few weeks ago, Isaac carried his own wood. Abraham by his side. Certainly the father is by Jesus' side as they walk up a mountain not too far from the mountain where Abraham and Isaac walked up when Isaac was about to be sacrificed. So what is going on here with the cross? What is going on with the, the whole story of the Bible? We have to, to, to look at that. And in and, and the text that Evan read, it, it, it's kind of right in there. We're going to look at that now. The, the cross is the disarming of Satan and his power. It's also many other things. It's the sacrifice for sin, the atonement, the appeasement. But we're going to look at today just one piece of the cross in the text that Evan read, which is the disarming of Satan. Humanity's need is to be rescued from Satan, from sin, and sin's power, and then the wages of sin, which are death. So you could kind of put it in one little statement. Our need is to be rescued from Satan, sin, and death. Um, that's our need. If you were to ask the world around us, they, they wouldn't say that that's our need. They would laugh at that. They would mock that. Um, but our need is to be rescued from Satan, sin, and death. Colossians two thirteen to 15. Let's look at our passage. This is the, the, the main focus of what we're looking at today. And you, who were dead in, in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So what, what is the problem? Well, we have a, a record of debt that's standing against every human being. There's a record of debt. And it has legal demands upon a human being. We need forgiveness because we are dead in our sins. How do we stop war? How do we stop child sex trafficking? How do we end pornography? How do we end hunger? There's psychologists, sociologists, PhDs all over the world. Everyone has a, a uh, solution to this problem. 
But the Bible goes to a very different solution and says the problem is not out there. It's not an environment problem. The problem is your heart. You are dead in your trespasses, and God will make you alive. And you have a, 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 a legal debt to pay because all human beings were made in the image and likeness of God to live and worship and obey God, and all human beings have gone astray. That is how the Bible diagnoses the problem with the world. It's much different than, than how the world diagnoses it. So how does Christ accomplish this? How, how is it accomplished? We know the problem. How is it fixed? Well, we see it right in the text here. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. He set it aside, nailing it to the cross. This is why, as Christians, we sing and rejoice about the cross. The cross is the power of God to a Christian, but to the world, it's confounding. What, what's happening here? Why is this man dying? And maybe he was just being an example to us. But to the Christian, the cross is the power of of God. Why is the cross the power of God? We have to ask that question. Why is it the power of God? Well, what was the result of the cross? We have it again right here in our text. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame. The rulers and authorities, what, what's being talked about here are the principalities of darkness. Satan and all his array of demons were disarmed on the cross. Now, I want you to to really take this picture in for a minute. What does it look like to be armed? Well, immediately, probably thinking gun, sword. What does it look like to be armed? Tank? At the cross, at the moment that Jesus died, Satan no longer had his arms. He was disarmed. His weapons were dropped. He still has the same schemes. He still has the same ways, but he does not hold power over God's people anymore. John 19, 28 to 30 says this. This is Jesus on the cross. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. At that moment, the head of Satan received a mortal blow. He was disarmed. Jesus stomped on his head at that moment. It is finished. Spurgeon says this, On the cross, Christ enjoyed a triumph. Yes, while those hands were bleeding, the acclamations of angels were being poured upon his head. Yes, while those feet were being rent with nails, The noblest spirits in the world were crowding round him with admiration. And when upon that blood-stained cross he died in agonies unutterable, there was such as was never heard before, for the ransomed in heaven, all the angels of God with loudest harmony chanted his praise. It is finished. The victory was won. Satan, his weapon was dropped. And if you're a thinking person, you, you have to ask, well, how, how Anthony? I, I, I look around and I look at this world and, and Satan seems to be pretty active. It seems to be that Satan still has some weapons. And that's actually a good thought. And we're going to look at why, for the Christian, Satan is unarmed. Because for the non-Christian, Satan is still armed. For the Christian, he's not. 
Christ conquered on the cross. What does this mean for my life now? Well, first, we're saved from the danger of sin and the repercussions of sin, which is God's judgment, God's wrath, hell. This is the biblical picture of salvation. And and I know even saying that, that can maybe... Not everyone is quite there yet. Um, But I I would submit to you that there's a a big problem, at least in American Christianity, where God's wrath, judgment, eternal consequences aren't talked about. You've got, often you hear a half gospel, which is God loves you, he died for you on the cross, and that is true. But what is happening on the cross is Jesus is absorbing the wrath and judgment of God for his people so they don't. So being saved from that is something that's going to evoke in you and me gratitude and worship. But if we take that out of the equation, you are short-circuiting an area of worship that is absolutely critical to the Christian. I'm going to tell a a famous uh, story. There's a lake in Germany um, called Lake Constance. I don't know if anyone in here knows anything about Germany, if anyone's been to Germany. It's called Lake Constance. It's a very large lake. If you think about Oneida Lake, it's much larger than Oneida Lake. Um, and there's a, a famous poem, and it, I think some say this happened, some say it's just a poem, but um, the poem goes something like this. There's a rider on a horse, and he's riding in the winter, and he sees a town in the distance, and he's riding through the mountains and riding through Things. And then all of a sudden, the, the terrain gets really flat for, for a, a long time. And he's riding, and he can see he's getting closer and closer and closer to uh, the village that, that he wants to go to. And he finally, after, after an hour of riding on this flat terrain, he gets to the village, and he talks uh, to a young woman and says, Hey, I, I'm, just, I'm riding through here, and I heard that there's a lake. I just want to know where it is so I don't ride over it and I ride around it. And she says, Sir, you just rode over it. You just rode over the lake. And towards the end of the poem, he falls down on his knees, sweats profusely, and is completely sobered that he was spared riding over that lake. And friends, I I often think in Christianity that, that we miss that. That there was a point in our life that we were in the realm of, of darkness and we were transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son. And we just we, we don't even talk about that. We act as if we were always in the kingdom of his beloved son. But that's just you can't read the Bible and, and come to that conclusion the only thing you can do is not read the Bible. Because if you do, you will see all over that that's what it's talking about. Uh, Gary Anderson says this, the story of the rider, he's talking about that um, story that I just told, illustrates a central phenomenon in the Christian life. It's not the man who is lost, but the man who is saved who can understand that he is a sinner. So this man had no idea he was riding over a lake they could have, ice could have broke at any moment, him and the horse dead. He had no idea. So while he was doing it, he was fine. It was only after he was told and understood what he did that he had gratitude and felt that. And that's how it works with us. But I, again, I, I, I think often we don't want to go there because it's too hard. We think about, well, what, what about this person? What about our loved one? What about, well, I would just say, what about you? What about you? That's what we got to be thinking about. Colossians 1:13 to 14 says, "He's delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, 
the forgiveness of sins. So we have been saved from the consequence of sin. We've been saved from that. That should well up a gratitude within us. And, and I would just ask, okay, practically, what does that mean? Well, I would just say, have you ever meditated upon that? Have you ever thought about that? Because when you think about that, a lot of the problems in your life get smaller. When we start thinking about what we deserve and what we have. The second thing is we have been saved from the power of sin on the cross. Romans six seventeen to 18 says, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, having become slaves of righteousness. If you know Jesus, you're no longer a slave to sin. Sin has lost its power over you. This is the disarming of Satan and the power. Satan has one, one weapon. And the weapon is the legal debt standing against you so he can condemn you and say, you did this, you did that, you did this, you did that, you deserve this, you deserve that. But Christ nailed that to the cross He doesn't have that power over you. If you know him, he has lost it. He still tries to use it, though. You hear a voice. You're being condemned. Go to Romans 8. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus for those who love him and those who are called. Right there, disarming. You're being tempted. God always provides a way out of the temptation. You And I, we are no longer slaves to sin. At one point, you were a slave to sin. You had no way to fight it. No way to fight it. And you may be thinking, okay, I I don't sin. And and, and I would just say, okay, the category of sin is so much bigger than we get. This is our pride. This is our self-sufficiency. This is our lusts of the flesh. You name it. It's a huge category. Um, If you don't know Christ, you're a slave to one, you're a slave somewhere to sin. God has given us new hearts, new desires, and a love for him. The last thing that I want to touch on here is Christ has crushed the head of Satan. He has bruised the head of the serpent, but God is also using you and me and the church to continually crush the head of the serpent. And I'll show you what I mean here in a minute. The days are evil. You and I can get lulled to sleep with entertainment and pleasure and, and children, to, for a minute to speak to some of the children in the room. You, you guys are being targeted in ways that we never were. That, that it... It's app after app, show after show of just to get you to piddle away your life on worthless things, worthless things. Or it's get in in the, the fake battle of whatever video game you're playing when there's a real battle to be had. And it's not a battle of pick up a gun, it's a battle of of crushing the head of the serpent, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But I I am convinced that the biggest weakness in in the American church today is we have forgotten that we're in a battle. Amen. You know, again, you can't read the Bible. The Bible's language is military language, all, all throughout it, military language. Satan is a roaring lion seeking someone to devour and what we do is we desperately, we pick up the word and we're looking for the word to just speak to me and, 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 and you know, caress my soul. Um, but really the word is telling us, get in the battle. You Watch out. Get, get in the battle. You're, being, you're, you're buying into lies. You're, you're, again, you're, you're spending your time on things that are not good. You're, you, you know, Satan is, is lulling 
us to sleep, lulling us to sleep. In, in Revelation 12, 17, we have this. And, and again, think about this, the, the seed of the woman, the, the offspring of the woman, the offspring of the serpent. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. Who is that? You. Me. The dragon is furious and is making war on the people of God. Do you have a category for that in your faith? That, That there is an enemy, an unseen enemy, wanting to take you down. On those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea, the dragon, the serpent, Satan, whatever you want to call him, is furious with God and wants to take you down. The question is, church, what does this look like? How does he do it? Because a lot of times we think Satan, we think Hollywood, we think movies. Like, okay, I don't have any of that in my life. Maybe, maybe I'm fine. Um, but the reality is he does it much more subtly. What is Satan, what does Jesus call Satan? He says, you're the the father of lies. He's a tempter. He's a liar. And he steals, kills, and destroys what is good. And that's going to look different in all of your lives. But I can tell you this. It's going to start with how you think and with lies. And those lies seem super, super plausible. They seem super plausible. They don't seem harmful, but they are. C.S. Lewis has a book called The Screwtape Letters. If you haven't read this book, I would highly recommend it. Um, He gets into the mind of a a demon, and he's talking about a demon and and a higher demon talking about how to take out Christians. That's what the book is about. And um, of course, he takes a lot of artistic liberty in the book, but it's, it's really interesting. But he has this one point where the, they were trying, the, the two demons are talking and, and they have their subject and the subject becomes a Christian and the demons begin talking about, okay, he's a Christian now. That's fine. We've lost him, but we want to take him out so he doesn't influence anyone else. And this is one of the so this is from, the, the, from a demon to another demon here. I'm going to read you a quote from Lewis. The real trouble with your patient, the patient is the Christian, is that he is merely Christian. What we want, if men become Christians at all, is to keep them in a state of mind I call Christianity and. You know, Christianity and the crisis. Christianity and the new psychology. Christianity and the new order, Christianity and faith healing, Christianity and physical research, Christianity and vegetarianism, substitute for the faith itself some fashion with a Christian coloring, work on the horror of the same old thing. This is one of the most valuable passions we have produced in the human heart, an endless source of heresies in religion, folly in counsel, infidelity in marriage, and inconstancy in friendships. So Lewis is putting his finger on something that we all struggle with, and I've got this in the sermon because I think this is one of the ways that the enemy slowly, subtly gets into your life and my life. First, Christianity and. That sounds... Okay, what do you mean, Christian? I work out. Well, that's not really what Lewis is talking about. He's talking about infusing Christianity with other philosophies and where that other philosophy or thing becomes just as big as your faith in God and the faith in the Bible where it then utterly destroys it. Because if you are a Christian, the word of God has to be here and everything else needs to be underneath it. If you've got it like this with anything in your life, you're not worshiping the God of the Bible. That's a different God. So Lewis is getting, he's getting on that 
thing that, okay, the enemy's going to, all right, they, you, you've become a Christian, but let me, what about, what about this? And I, I would just ask, you know, how many of you early on in your Christian walk it got sidetracked with, with maybe some other philosophy and then realized, okay, this, this is, I got to, I got to get back to the word. I know I did. It happens. It's an enemy tactic. He's using it all of the time, all of the time. The other thing that, that he's using is, Lewis points out, the, the, the same old thing. How can the church be the plan of God? Look at it. Look, look at me. Look at you. Same old thing. Okay, we're doing this again. Same old thing. Sunday, really? Anthony, you're sitting up here again talking about the seed of the woman crushing the head of the seed of the serpent. Same old thing. <sighs> Come on, can't we do something different? Can't we do something different? Maybe there's something we got to... Let's go conquer the world out here, right? Like, same old thing. You know, the Bible. <sighs> Come on, can't, shouldn't we do something singing the same songs. And he says this is one of the most valuable passions that, that demons have for people. And again, this is Lewis. This is not from the Bible. This is him kind of thinking, but I think it's brilliant. Like, yeah, the same old thing. What is the same old thing? Well, it's going to cause infidelity, like he said. It's going to cause what? Heresy. What uh, The biggest thing going on in Christianity these, these days is Hey, we've got this new way to, to read Paul. We've got this new way to do church. No. Same old thing. Historic Christianity. And I would just ask you, are you bored with the Bible? Are you bored with, with Christianity? Then you're, you're missing something then. And I say that out of love. If you're bored with the Word of God, you're bored with just regular church, um, you're putting something above the word and what God puts out there is the word. So Satan is going to come after us. We are the offspring of the woman. So here's how I would like to end it. Romans 16.20 says this, and this is going to harken back to our Genesis verse. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Satan is going to be crushed under our feet. God is using the church to stomp on the head of the serpent. Even though he's already done it and he's caused that mortal wound, we still are doing that. What do you mean, Pastor? Every time you share the gospel with someone, you're stomping on the head of the serpent. Every time you choose to obey God rather than the lusts of your flesh, you are stomping on the head of the serpent. Every time you get angry and refuse to act on your anger, you are stomping on the head of the serpent. Every time a brother or sister irritates you and you don't react, you are stomping on the head of the serpent. Every time you shine your light in the dark world, you are stomping your head, stomping the head of the serpent. Every time you see someone who needs encouragement and you share a word of encouragement with them, you are stomping on the head of the serpent. When you become a source of life, in safety for those around you instead of a source of erratic behavior or a threat to those around you, you are stomping on Satan's domain, stomping on the head of the serpent. When a man loves his wife, listens to her, and washes her in the word and leads her, you are stomping on the head of the serpent. When a wife loves her husband, and encourages him and submits to his leadership, you are stomping on the head of the serpent. When you decide to be in God's word, instead of wasting your time on social media, you are stomping on the head of the serpent. When you decide that you will be part of a church 
and commit to being in it and commit to relationships in it, you are stomping on the head of the serpent. When you take it upon yourself to pray to God instead of worrying, you are stomping on the head of the serpent. When you give financially to the church, you are stomping on the head of the serpent. And all the while that you do this, the enemy is going to be nipping at your heel as you stomp, whispering, 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 telling you lies. But Satan has been disarmed, so we do not have to believe those lies. He was disarmed on the cross. His weapons are out of his hands. He's still trying to use them, but they're gone. Praise be to Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you, Lord, and we love the cross, and we love the sacrifice of the cross, and I do pray that we can see maybe in a different light that what happened on the cross was a disarming of a power that the enemy has over people. I pray that we can know that we are no longer slaves to sin. We're slaves to righteousness. That the power of sin has no hold on us. We can be tempted, but we are not powerless over sin. We thank you for that, Lord. We look to the resurrection to come as we will look at next week. But this week, Lord, help us to think and meditate upon the cross, upon the the garden, and, and upon our Savior fighting this battle for his people, agonizing in this battle for his people. Lord, help us to see a bit of the humanity of our brother Christ. But let's also not forget his deity. And we pray this all in your name. Amen. Thanks for tuning in with us. We hope that you found this sermon edifying, encouraging, and challenging. To learn more about Vintage Faith Church, visit vintagefaithcicero.com. And of course, if you live in the area, we invite you to worship the Lord with us on Sunday mornings.